Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let, let's begin with prayer this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your love and for the beauty of your character and for Jesus Christ. We ask that you will send your spirit to enlighten our hearts and minds and bring us into the unity of the faith. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So just want to remind all of our online audience, and of course you guys locally, but you know because you come in every week into the lobby, you see all of our materials there. But online, uh, we have a lot of free resources for you all to share, uh, all of our various magazines. So uh, be sure, and if you need some to share, to email us, to get some, we'll ship it out to you with a U.S. postal address at no charge. But we also have most of our resources available in Australia and South Africa if you're in one of those locations, and we have different addresses, email addresses for you to request in those locations. Also, our website is filled with all types of resources, our classes, our seminars, our blogs, our podcasts. So avail yourself and share, share that with other people. And don't forget the Remedy app if you don't have it on your device already. Um, you can get those resources as well. So we're doing lesson six in the uh, quarterly Ephesians. And the title is The Mystery of the Gospel. And the first paragraph in the lesson reads... In Ephesians 3, Paul opens with a theme that he has already touched on earlier, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And though, and though that might not be much of a surprise to the church today, composed mostly of Gentiles, it was something that seemed radically new to many of his readers at the time. Question is, why? was this idea that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with the Jews, radical and new. Was this something that had not been taught in the scripture? Was the message that God, through his prophets, uh, that salvation was through and by the Jews, in other words, you had to be Jewish, you had to come into the Jewish faith in order to have salvation? Was that, is that what was actually taught in scripture? Or does the Old Testament teach that salvation is not restricted by ethnic, national, or racial lines? It is restricted or is not restricted? So just look, let's just look at some Bible verses, what the Old Testament, and, and, and say, I'm going to show you just a sampling of the Old Testament. And remember, in Paul's day, this, it's a mystery, the mystery of God that Gentiles are joint heirs. This is how it's presented by Paul. It's a, it was a mystery that was hidden. But this is what the Old Testament scripture said. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on the earth will be blessed through him. The angel of the Lord called Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, and this is important because Isaac, the promise is given not through Ishmael, Isaac, through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed. Then in Isaiah, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Or Psalms 22, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Or Psalms 86, 9, all the nations you have made will come and worship before you, uh, before, before you, O Lord, they will bring glory to your name. Or how about Daniel 7, 13 and 14? In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And then Isaiah 49, 6, maybe the most powerful, it says, it is too small a thing for you, speaking in this in the context is the Messiah, to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles so that you might, may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Wow. Huh. This is a sampling. There's more. I think we can make the case just from this sampling that the Old Testament taught that the plan of salvation for the whole world, all the people, mm -hmm. everybody, not just the Jews. Can't we make the case from the Old Testament? Yes. Yes. And the Old Testament narrative is the narrative of 
working to bring the promised Messiah that was promised where? Where did, where did the first promise of the Messiah show up in Scripture? Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15. The, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. That, right there. The promised Messiah is coming to save the people. And the whole Testament narrative is the fulfillment of that promise to save. And that promise was given in Eden with how many ethnic groups available? <laughs> Adam and Eve. This is the promise to the human race. And Christ is coming to save the children of Adam and Eve, which are all human beings. And this is, this is the whole context of Scripture. Are there examples in the Old Testament? These were declarative statements, descriptive statements that I've read. There are historical accounts of people who stand as evidence of salvation coming to them outside of the system of Judaism, not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not participating in the temple, not doing the sacrificial system in Old Testament times, yet they were saved. Do we see that? No, Rahab and Ruth became part of the system. They were adopted in. They married into the system. So they would be people who weren't born to the system, but then were considered legally Jews because they were adopted in. Naaman, Naaman. Naaman would be good. Yep. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. How about all of the patriarchs prior to Abraham? Noah. He's not a descendant of Abraham, is he? Obviously not. Seth. Abel. Adam and Eve. Enoch. I mean, there's lots of people in Old Testament times being saved that are not descended from Abraham. How about Melchizedek? Jethro? Lot? Sarah? The wise men from the east? who brought gifts to Jesus. I mean, there's lots of historical examples that the promise of salvation was being realized in the lives of people outside of Judaism. This is the point. So you have the descriptive and declarative statements. You have the evidence of lives actually experiencing it, confirming evidence. So then where did this belief come from that salvation was restricted to the Jews? Well, I think that God um, asked them to be separate from the people around them so they didn't take on their habits, their idols, and all that. And they interpreted separatism as, you know, you can't associate with them, you better stay away from them, salvation is for us and us alone, because if we get near so, them... So while he t was telling the instruction to be separate from the people around them, did that instruction include... Don't witness to the people around you. Don't evangelize. Don't be my priest to the world. Don't take the message and, uh, of, of, of salvation. Uh, isolate and be exclusive. Is that, is that, was that the message? Well, that's the way they took the message. But, but, so my point being, did the message that you're saying also include a message that we were to be active in taking the message to the world? They were given simultaneously. They were not, it was not be separate and don't communicate. Be separate in your practices and principles in the way you live and communicate that blessing to the world. Mm. Yes? Mm. Where? What? Where does it say that? So it says it all through the Old Testament. We are called to be a kingdom of priests, a nation of priests, of witnesses. Uh, you are to go out and evangelize the world with this. Do we see the example of, uh, I don't know, Jonah being sent by God to witness? To the worst of the worst. To only Jews? <laughs> no. no. Right. Constantly. So yes, there was this message of, of come out and be separate, but be separate in what way and how. You're correct. They interpreted it in a way, but my point is that message had to be, what's the word I'm looking for? Not just misunderstood, <laughs> had to be, what, what is it when you take a little here and you take a little there and you, and you take the bits you like and you ignore the bits you don't? Cherry yeah, that was a cherry pick message. It wasn't the actual full message from God. It was a partial message from God. And this is what happens in scripture today. A little text here, a little text there, pull them together, uh, make out the view that you like and then advance it yeah. and claim that you're supporting the Bible. Exactly. I think that's what you're describing. So yeah, there was a biblical basis for it if you cherry pick, but it was not the real message they were given. Was it? 
Yeah, that, that's, that's the point I'm making. So the, so, but it's a good point. So how did their mind come to think this? Well, there was ideas that they could use to support it, like that one. This is out of a book called The Desire of Ages, in page 204, and it says, the Jews had so perverted the law that they made it a yoke of bondage. Their meaningless requirements had become a byword among other nations, especially was the Sabbath hedged in by all manner of senseless restrictions. It was not to them a delight, the holy of the Lord and honorable. The scribes and Pharisees had made its observance an intolerable burden. A Jew was not allowed to kindle a fire or even light a candle in the Sabbath. As a consequence, the people were dependent upon the Gentiles for many services which the rules forbade them to do for themselves. They did not reflect that if these acts were sinful, those who employed others to perform them were as guilty as if they had done the work themselves. I mean, if you hire an assassin to kill for you, okay, you're guilty also, okay, this is the point. Okay, they thought that salvation was restricted to the Jews and that the condition of all others so there it is. They thought that salvation was restricted to the Jews and that the condition of all others being already hopeless could not be made worse. But God has given no commandments which cannot be obeyed by all and his laws sanction no unreasonable or selfish restrictions. What's the root of the problem here? Humans. Humans. <laughs> okay, sin. Okay, sin. Selfishness, egotism, pride, narcissism. We're better, you're worse. Okay, yeah, this is the root. The devil is working with these people, and it <clears throat> happens in every organization. They pick and choose the things that they want. They become powerful. They want to keep that, so they start doing all these other things to control the people around them. And, and, is that happening today? And is there a description here of functionally what they were doing? They twisted the law. They twisted the law into what kind of a system? Rules. Rules, authoritarianism. And isn't that how people in the worldly systems get power? Mm -hmm. It's a different twist on survival of the fittest. <laughs> they were trying to become the fit. Well, that, and what drives survival of the fittest is fear. Fear of being harmed causes people to want to be powerful so they can identify threats and destroy threats before self is harmed. That's the basic drive. It's the opposite of love, where love wants to give to bless others and will sacrifice self for others, will kill others in order to protect and advance self. And, what, and some of that's physical. Some of that could be economical, pos, uh, position of power and authority, and so forth and so on. It's about being more powerful and in the systems of religion that were being practiced by the Jews, it was about who had the most authority to, to use the system to dominate over others. And how did they came to believe this? Was it only that they believed that earthly systems, or did they actually believe God's system ran this way? They, they, they believed God's system ran this way. Remember the quotation that we read a week or two ago? It's found uh, in the introduction to the book, The Great Controversy, written by Ellen White. And it says, the great controversy is, the great controversy between Christ and Satan, Christ, the prince of life, the author of salvation, and Satan, the prince of evil, the author of sin, the first transgressor of God's holy law. Satan's enmity against Christ has been manifested against his followers. The same hatred of the principles of God's law, the same policy of deception by which error is made uh, to appear truth, by which human laws are substituted for the laws of, of God, and men are led to worship the creature rather than the creator, may be traced in all the history of the past, in all the history. Satan's effort to misrepresent the character of God, to cause men to cherish false conceptions of the Creator, and thus to regard him with fear and hate rather than with love. His endeavor to set aside, set aside divine law. If you worship a God who imposes rules and is required by law to use his power to punish rule breakers, that's how creatures govern. You're worshiping a creature. You're not worshiping the Creator. This is what is being described here. They worship a creature. This is Satan's goal. Satan can't speak into existence reality. He can't create and sustain the laws that govern the operations of life. 
as a being, a created being with certain power, he can make up rules like we can, and he can threaten and use his power to hurt people who break his rules. That's what we can do. That's a creature. Now notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Paul goes on to describe in verses 24, 26, and 28 what God's wrath is, and we've gone over this many times. Therefore, God gave them up or let them go. If you insist on going your own way and breaking off from God, he lets you reap what you have sown. This is what uh, God does not use power as the creator to inflict the punishment for sin. What the creator does, if you decide to break design law, is he stops using power to protect you from the harm your actions are causing. Do you understand the difference? So imagine you have a rebellious child and you're uh, taking a tour of the Empire State Building and your child goes to jump off and you grab a hold of him. You're intervening to use power to stop the consequence. But then the child pulls out a knife and starts jabbing your hand and he's rebelling, you're, but you're sacrificial. You're going to take the pain because it's your child, you love him. But it goes on and on and on and on and on. And everything you do, your child insists on going over the cliff. What do you have to do in order for your child to reap the punishment of their action? Let go. This is what Paul's describing. That, that when you break God's laws that life are built upon, you bring harm and damage to yourself. And God is actively working, using power to hold at bay those consequences. But if you insist and insist and insist to the point that, that you actually take yourself out of harmony, you destroy the faculties that can respond, you, you're beyond healing, then God in mercy and love lets you go to reap what you, and that's God's wrath. He lets go. He doesn't infl- the human law system requires that any break the law the sovereign used power to inflict harm. It's the exact opposite. God has been using power to hold harm at bay. So this is what Paul's saying. And then he goes on, since what may be known about God is plain to them. This is the truth that they're suppressing. They're suppressing truth by their wickedness. And the truth they suppress is what may be known about God because it is plain to them for God has made it plain to them. And why is it plain to them? Notice Paul's reason. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. From the moment of creation, the truth about God has been revealed in what he has made. And what is the truth about God that nature reveals? How does nature operate? Now, in our sinful world, there's an infection that's countering the law of sin and death. The survival drives are here. That's not part of God's line. God did not sow seeds into the, uh, of death into the system. God did not put weeds. God did not put thorns. So we do see the systems being contaminated, but you can still see the lessons. They're still there, the lessons of truth. And what does it reveal? What kind of laws do nature operate upon? And then Paul tells us what happens when they reject the truth about God. Notice again, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God. He's breaking right in the middle of the sentence. They never glorified him as God. Are we, do we, do you all in this room believe that there's a special message that God has given for the end time people to give glory to him? But these people did not glorify God. How are we to glorify him? What does it mean to glorify him? To get together, hold hands, and sing praise songs? I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but is that really what it means? Just to to use words, we give glory to God in our words. Or does glory to God mean we reveal his glory, which is his character, in how we live? We look like him in heart, mind, and character, and the methods that we practice, and how we treat other people. They will know you're my disciples by your 28 fundamental belief statements and your baptismal certificate. Is that what it says? No. By your love. You will live in love like Jesus did. This is how we give glory to him. But they didn't glorify God. They replace God as the creator and they worship. Now notice what they do. They neither glorify him nor give thanks to him, but in their, their thinking became futile 
and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Making false images of God in the likeness of mortal man is not restricted to a statue. It means worshiping a being who functions like a mortal man. A rule maker, an authoritarian dictator, a person who is the source of inflicted external punishments and death for breaking their rules. If you worship that God, you're worshiping a creature, not the creator. And by beholding, you become changed. You become like that God. You become rigid. You become judgmental. You become authoritarian. You become pharisaical, very religious, a religion without power to change hearts and minds. And Paul says, if you worship that kind of a God, the creature, not the creator, your mind is being darkened. And even though you have a degree in theology and consider yourself wise, Paul says you become a fool. And I'm going to tell you, those religious theologians in Christ's day who crucified him and wanted him off the cross to keep the Bible Sabbath were fools. Yes or no? Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Yep, and I, I'm going to tell you, this is much, much of the state of Christianity across the landscape of the world today. Worshiping a creature, an authoritarian dictator who makes up rules and is the source of death when the Bible teaches very clearly that Satan is the source of death. God is the source of life. Sunday's lesson, Paul focuses, uh, the, the lesson focuses on Paul as a prisoner in Rome. The lesson points out the status of Uh, Paul being a prisoner could undermine the esteem of his audience. When they get a letter from Paul and he's a prisoner, that this could undermine their respect for him. So Paul takes that fact he's a prisoner and turns it into a badge of honor, describing himself as a prisoner for Christ or a prisoner because of Christ. Have you ever considered what your attitude might have been like had you been a member of the church of Ephesus and received a letter from Paul written from prison? If you were today, if, we were, if I were to tell you today, I've got a letter from a person, um, he's written it to us today, instructing us how we can better, better fulfill God's purpose. Now, he's in prison over there in, in San Quentin. Does it bias you at all to know that? Yeah. Essentially? Sort of. Yeah. And, 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 of course, would it matter for what reason they're in prison? Yeah. How about if they're in prison because they're an anarchist? They tried to overthrow the government by marching through a building, holding a flag. And they've been in prison for two years. Yeah. Happening. They're an anarchist. The government tells you they're an anarchist. They're trying to overthrow good order in society. How about if you're told that they're a, they're a, child, they're, they're a, tr- uh, a human trafficker? <clears throat> now, I didn't say they are a human trafficker. I said, you're told they're a human trafficker. Do you understand the power of what allegations and acts? Who's the accuser of the brethren? So, in Christ's day, this is a, a, I'm going to break this strategy down for you. The enemies of truth, they cannot refute the truth. The truth always exposes their fraudulence. And so, have you ever heard the statement, if you can't destroy the message, destroy the messenger? Right. Those who don't like truth want to take your eyes off the truth so you don't consider it, you don't think about it, you don't evaluate it. They want to undermine the one who brings the truth so you never even consider the truth in the first place. It's a classic strategy. They tried it on Jesus. The Jews answered him. This is John 8, 28. The Jews answered him, aren't we right to say that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Now, they weren't saying that primarily to hurt Jesus' feelings. They were saying that as church leaders, so the audience who were trying to make up their mind whether they should listen to Jesus or not, oh, the leaders say he's demon-possessed and he's, and he's, he's no better than a dirty old Samaritan. <laughs> what does he know? And, and there's mother, multiple other allegations they did. How can you teach us anything? Where did you go to school? They brought that up on him all the time. Oh, who was your father again? You're not, you're not even legitimate. 
constantly, what are they doing? It's not primarily to hurt Jesus' feelings. It's to undermine his reputation amongst the people so they won't listen to him. Classic strategy happens all the time. Oh, he associates with tax collectors and eats with prostitutes. What do you think he's doing after dinner over there, folks? Yeah. <laughs> this is the implication, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. In the South, there's a, there's a saying that um, they'd rather climb a tree backwards than tell the truth. <laughs> rather than dealing with the facts and the evidence... They wouldn't have a meaningful discussion and, and because to have a meaningful discussion would require them to admit they're wrong. The devil has a well-practiced game plan, strategy, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to show you the practice that he, that he hits the, the people and the voices of truth with. It's a, it's a, it's a sta- stepwise progression. It happens over and over again. See if you can see this. And as I show you this strategy... I'll give you some examples from history. See if you can drop in from your memory more times than the one I'm giving you where, where you've seen the same thing playing out. First is deception. A voice of, somebody who's speaking truth, the devil tries to deceive them or trick them into accepting a lie so they become a purveyor of lies. You see this uh, when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, when the devil presents himself in a fraudulent light as an angel of light and misquotes scripture to try to trick him. First approach he always tries to trick or to deceive the voices of, of, of truth. But if that doesn't work, if he can't get you with straight out deception, he tries to bribe you to buy you. Remember, he took Jesus and said, all the kingdoms of the world I'll offer you if you'll, if you'll go along and, and promote my lie. Uh, you can be very wealthy in the lies if you'll just go along. In fact, you, just be quiet. you don't even have to say anything. If you'll just shake my hand in public and let me do the talking, okay? <laughs> just recognize me as your friend and pal, okay? You won't even have to really lie directly. Just go along with the lie. And, 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 and I'll give you a, a big promotion, corner office, new car, all the kingdoms of the world. So deception, bribes, inducements. If that doesn't work, then it's slander. Destroy the voice of truth. Slander, accusation. I gave you examples of those accusations against Jesus a moment ago. And and then when that doesn't work, using the slander, using the allegations, stir up the mob. Stir up the the community to reject, to attack, to vilify, to to, uh, to, um, isolate, to intimidate. And how many times was Jesus confronted by mobs? How many times did the Pharisees stir? And you read the account before the final crucifixion when the mob got inflamed. They tried to stone him several times, and it wasn't his time yet, so God delivered him. Stir up the mob to attack, to intimidate, to silence. And then imprisonment, restrict liberties. Do Do you see these tactics being used against the apostles? Do you see the apostles being imprisoned? And then if imprisonment won't silence you, you can't destroy, if they can't kill your name, can't kill your reputation, can't silence you with imprisonment, then what's the final solution? Death, death, death. Crucifixion, beheading, mm-hmm. burning at the stake, killing. Satan's game plan follows the same tra- trajectory every single time. Wow. Now, do you see the same script being run today yeah. in our society? Yes. Absolutely. And you should ask who's running it. Well, ultimately, Satan and demons are running it. But if you can look into society and see certain leaders, groups, I'm not going to name them. I don't have to name them. But if you see certain organizations and groups running the, the propaganda, the lies, the censoring, the mobs, the intimidation, the accusations, the name calling, the imprisonment without charge and without, I mean, on and on. And if they could, they would actually, there's no doubt in my mind, they would kill the voices that are opposing them. This is exactly what God describes in Revelation will ultimately happen to the voices of his truth at the end of time. The real meaning of cancel culture. (laughs) No, that's right. Now, I've experienced some of these. No, I have. I've had to confront various lies being told about me around the circle over the years things done to try to ruin my reputation. He doesn't believe in the blood atonement. He doesn't believe in the substitutionary nature of Christ's death for our, our salvation. 
just accusations without substance. He's a moral influence theory teacher. He teaches moral influence theory. On and on the accusations. And what are the intent of those accusations? To get people to not examine what we teach for themselves. You don't need to listen to him. We've already determined he teaches heresy. That's actually been said about me. Oh, if he's a heretic, if he's a heretic, we don't want to listen. We don't want to. It's been said to us. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you have heard those things yeah. said. It's a classic strategy. And then I've had certain forms of mobs, not physical mobs, but I've, in multiple occasions, multiple occasions over the years, <laughs> been scheduled by various churches and organizations to come and speak into a seminar. And when they print their brochures and put it out in the various church magazines to advertise the upcoming speaker schedule, a mob forms of typically church employees, typically with a, with a certain ordination certificate behind their name, <laughs> that, uh, that, that forms a, a mob to pressure the or inviting organization to cancel me and I don't get to speak. It's happened multiple times. Rather than saying, hey, Jennings is willing to have you who don't agree with him show up and you guys can have a, a, a polite back and forth where you're both given a certain amount of time to present your views and you can present your views and then you can have an open discussion and both take questions from the audience and answer them and so forth and let the people decide, let the truth weigh out. Amen. I've and offered this many times. These people who do this never, never want to do it. Never. <laughs> So what happens when you don't have truth? Cancel culture. And most of them are just reporting what they've heard. They haven't investigated for themselves. That's true, too. Exactly. That's yeah. true, too. Mm -hmm. Did you see this evil method used when loving, concerned people raised fair and legitimate questions about the safety of a certain medical product being advanced under emergency youth authorizations. <laughs> Did you see that they were accused of wanting to kill people? Yeah. They were accused. All, I, in the medical literature, anybody who had a question. Did you see they were silenced? Did you see they were censored and censored? Do you see they were threatened by mobs, some physically, some by professional mobs and authorities with their licenses and so forth and so on? Have you seen the same thing happening in society right now when loving, concerned people raise legitimate questions about the mutilation of children because... and and. and and as soon as they do, they're attacked and accused of being transphobes and other types of haters. And why do they do that? Rather than the people saying, let's, let's look at the medical and scientific evidence. Because it has been looked at by multiple, multiple national and other medical bodies around the world. And the evidence is overwhelming that any interventions in childhood and adolescence along these lines causes significant more harm than any benefit. Amen. It's not even close. That's why they can't have a discussion on it. That's why they want to only accuse and inflame mobs to silence. Notice the methods. They're evil. The, the Christian method is truth presented in love, leaving people free to decide for themselves. What's happening is a purposeful attack on objective reality on people's minds. Understand the Bible is very clear. Your life experiences are very clear. And science is very clear that there actually is male and female. <laughs> That's not a trick. It said, and Jesus affirmed it himself. He said, do you not read the scriptures? God made them male and female. Even the animals, most the animals know that. That's right. And you know it too. And so what's happening now is really not about people who have some type of gender confusion. That's not what's happening in society. They are being used as pawns 
by powerful elites who want to destroy your capacity to be connected with objective reality. Amen. That's what's happening. If you accept this lie, this fantasy, this fable, this myth that there is no male and female, you have just surrendered your capacity for any decision-making and discernment of any kind. You will now surrender to voices of authority all future decisions of any relevance. Somebody has to tell you the answer because there is no objective standard for you to be able to determine right or wrong. That's the real goal, to turn people to mindless serfs who are controlled by the powerful elites. You can't question. We say it's this way, it's this way. Who are you to question? That's the goal here. Monday's lesson. It asks us to read Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. We'll read it out of the NIV. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into, this, into the mystery of Christ, which was, not made known to, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God, God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. We already went through a multiple, multiple Old Testament texts that show that they should have understood. But Paul here is saying that this was a mystery, not revealed and not understood by men of the past, but revealed through the prophets and the apostles. Why didn't Saul of Tarsus know this? Didn't Saul of Tarsus have a degree in theology? Didn't he study the Old Testament scriptures? Didn't I just give you a bunch of Old Testament scriptures showing that all this was true already? So how was it Saul of Tarsus, a studier and de doctoral degree holder of uh, Old Testament studies, says he didn't know it? It had to be revealed by God to him. It had to be revealed to him. What law language did he use? There you go. Because he was educated in the Jewish system of the school of the prophets. And by that time, that system had been so corrupted that they misrepresented what the scriptures meant and taught. This is why Jesus, God did not allow Jesus to be taught in the schools of the prophets. He was taught by his mother from the scriptures and from nature directly. Because the school of the prophets had not just the Old Testament, they had all those other Mishnah and all these other man-made rules. And Jesus confronts them multiple times. You've heard it said it was honor your mother and father, but you put away the, the instructions of God so that you can keep your rules. Korban. Oh, if I call Korban on my, all my property, then I don't have to use any of my property to help my parents. I get to keep it all for me until I die. And then it goes to the, to the temple. That was their rule. Keeping up the building was a higher virtue than caring for one's parents, in their view. Wow, that's true. What's wrong with that picture? They did many of these types of things. On Sabbath, you can only walk so many feet. <laughs> we, uh, we heard it. A talk, I mean, it was actually a debate between a Messianic Jew and a Pharisaical Jew. And the Pharisaical Jew actually admitted during the conversation or discussion that he, that they, if it came to a toss up between what God's word said and their laws said, they would choose, even today, they would choose their law over God's. That's right. That's exactly right. You, th you think that's restricted? I showed you that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I showed it to you in the past that in the book Cross of Christ, it's written in there. Nowhere in Scripture does Paul, the Scripture never, the Scripture never says that God is reconciled to, to man. It always says that man is reconciled to God. In spite of that fact, though, they go on, so they recognize that the Bible says it's true. And then they go on to say, but in spite of that fact, we must recognize that sin affected God and God needed reconciliation to us. 
by the blood of his son to propitiate his wrath. This is what they go on to say. So they're not the only ones who, when they recognize what the Bible says, will take their own understanding of the law and deny the Bible in order to support their own theory. Some of the punishments for them not keeping these Sabbath laws and all of these laws that the Pharisees had, I, maybe I missed that, but I don't... Did they punish them or did they... Stoning. Well, yeah, that's... <laughs> stoning for, 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 not, for breaking the Sabbath law it was stoning you remember they, they wanted to stone Jesus for healing on the Sabbath yeah. mm -hmm. no, no, not for starting for healing on the Sabbath you stone him you break our rule <laughs> right. Do, do you remember that the Jews kept falling into Baal worship? Remember that? Now, do, do, can, can y'all, I've, I've done this many times. Can anybody remember what Baal worship was in Old Testament? Baal was the son of El. El was the father, as in E-L, E-L, spelled E-L, El, Elohim, El Shaddai, okay? El was the father. Baal was El's son. Baal was the God of creation and weather, the God of thunder and lightning, the God that brought rain, the God that brought the harvest, the God that brought life through the, the, uh, the, the crops and the harvest coming each year. Baal fought against Leviathan, the great serpent, and Baal fought against the God of death known as Mote, and in Baal's battle with Mote, the God of death, Baal dies and rises again to bring life to the land. This is who the Mesopotamian God Baal or Baal or Baal was that the Jews kept worshiping. Now, what would be the problem? I'm sure none of you would worship the son of God, the son of El, who fights against the serpent, the great deceiver, who fights against death and in his battle with death dies to destroy death and rises again to bring us life and who is the creator of, of the weather and controls the weather and tells peace be still to the, to the storms. You would never worship a God like that, would you? Do you, do you see how, how close Satan's lies? Now, what made Baal, as I, I say that to you, what made it false then? Baal required appeasement and sacrifice. The worshiper had to bring a gift or an offering of blood to Baal in order to be blessed. Um, and if you didn't bring an offering of blood, then Baal was, would, would punish. Baal became Zeus to the Greeks, the god of thunder, Jupiter to the Romans, Thor to the Norse people, and Jesus Christ to all Christians who worship a God who must be appeased by the blood of a human sacrifice, lest he not forgive you, and in fact is required by law to punish you. That's Baal worship. That's worshiping a creature rather than the creator, and that's why in Malachi, Jesus, uh, the Bible says that before the great and terrible day of the Lord, before the second coming, the prophet Elijah must come again, to call us back to worship the true God. Yes. The sanctuary service could have been misinterpreted to be that too. In fact, I, ha I read a quote, or I have a quote, Ellen White says explicitly that the sanctuary service, which was given by God and designed by God to show that from him comes the sacrifice necessary to save us, was misinterpreted and perverted by Satan to teach that God required that, that men in vain hope attempt to propitiate with blood sacrifice the anger of an offended God. That's what she says in Prophets and Kings. Back to Adam and Eve. Yes. Now Cain and Abel, yes. their sacrifices. So did that whole mindset start way back there? So the mindset about an punishing God started in heaven with Lucifer's lies. Yeah. Every sin must meet its punishment. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan declared the law of God cannot be obeyed. And if man should uh, uh, disobey, he could not be forgiven. Every sin must meet its punishment urged to Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he is not a God of truth and justice. Uh, Desire of Ages 761, I believe, yes. But the sacrifice part of it to their God was what Cain and Abel were dealing with. No. They were not sacrificing to their God. It doesn't say sacrifice. It, they, they were following the instructions to act out the plan of salvation and redemption. So what do you think the purpose of animal sacrifice was? Okay, partly, that's correct. 
right to God. She's part, partly, partly, she says that's exactly correct, to hate sin. Well, um, you, remember, these people, these people in Old Testament times, uh, the Jews, if you want evidence for this, look at when they went, when Jacob's, Joseph's brothers and sisters came to Egypt, the Egyptians had very little respect for them because of a particular profession that they were in. What was their profession? Shepherds. 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 Okay. They're sheep herders. The, they, they actually tend, and, and, and what would a good shepherd do when a, when a wolf comes? Protect. Protect the sheep. Numbers the sheep. Name, maybe even names the sheep. Now, I want you to imagine, to bring it home to you, any of you all have a pet, pet dog, pet cat? Okay, that you protected and you fed and you've nurtured and maybe you were there when it was born and you, you, you helped it train it and it grew up and then you've committed a sin and now you have to confess your sins over the head of your puppy and you have to look in its eyes while you take a knife and you cut its throat as it's looking to you like a little lamb trusting you with its life. Get your mind. This is what they had to do. Now what would that experience be like for you? Would, it have a, would you have a gut reaction to it? Yes. Would it be, I think I'll go out and sin some more? <laughs> no. Or would it be, I never, ever want to sin again? It was designed partially to make them understand the malignity and disgust and horror and horribleness of what sin does to God's creation. It also taught an object lesson. If you remember in Leviticus 17, it says that life is in the blood. And what does the blood do in, in any body? It circulates. Remember the law of love is the law of giving. It just circles and circles and circles. And then they confess sin, and then they take a knife, and they, not God, not the priest, not the representative of God, they cut the circulation. It's an object lesson teaching reality. Sin breaks, severs God's design for life, and if you do that, the outcome is death. So God is teaching them how, why death comes, because it breaks the way he did, and it's their actions, their sinfulness that is breaking it, and it's teaching them that you should hate the breaks of the design because the breaks of the design bring only pain and suffering and harm. You should love living in harmony with the design and the design laws. So this is the purpose of the sacrifice. It has nothing to do with appeasing him. I was just thinking, I mean, I understand that, but I was thinking, is that where they start getting that concept? No, it started in heaven. Every sin must meet its punishment, urge Satan. Okay? It started in the tree for human beings when, when, when uh, the serpent said, did God really say in the day you eat, you will die? Oh, no, you won't. Okay? Stop and think. God is saying, if you deviate from my designs, the only result of that is ruin and death. Satan is saying, oh, no, there's no harm. You won't die. Now, I'm not saying God won't kill you for it. I'm saying you won't die from eating the tree of the fruit. You won't die from disobedience. There's nothing harmful in disobeying God. There's only something harmful in what God will do to you for it. That's the implication of his first deception, that again, sin requires punishment. So it was there in Eden as well. That's where these ideas come from. They're Satan's original lies. I'm going to jump ahead. Let's see, how far do I need to jump? Because we're... <laughs> we'll go into uh, Tuesday's lesson. And uh, the second and third paragraph in Tuesday's lesson reads, there is an interesting progression in Paul's self-understanding un- self that is discernible as we move through Paul's letters in, order, in, or- in the order they were written. Early on, he lays claim to the status of a divinely appointed apostle, Galatians 1.1. Later, though, he introduces himself as the least of the apostles and not worthy to be called an apostle, 1 Corinthians 15.9. Here in Ephesians, he sees himself as the the very least of all the saints, Ephesians 3.8. And finally, he describes himself as the chief of or worst of sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. Perhaps this line of thinking here by Paul can help explain this famous quote by Ellen White, quote, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Have you ever experienced that? The longer you've walked with Jesus, the more inadequate you actually feel. Does that mean you're actually getting worse? 
It feels that way because feelings are the best barometer for truth. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> no. 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 No, it's not that way. In fact, it could be an evidence, uh, again, the perception of our own inadequacies are quite different than objective, rebellious living. There's a difference between Paul using the power of the state to arrest, persecute, and stone people who believed differently than he did, Saul of Tarsus, prior to his conversion. The, the function of what he was doing was quite actual harmful and evil. When he writes this to Timothy, like, he's not functioning that way at all. So there's a difference between his perception of himself as he comes closer to Christ and sees how deeply embedded into his motives and his attitudes of heart the infection of, of fear and self-centeredness is. It's deeply embedded, and he recognizes how, how in every aspect he is tempted along these lines, and he hates it. Oh, what wretched man and I. But that's quite different than how he was functioning. He functioned quite righteously. Okay. And so, so, so that's where you have to make that distinction. Do I recognize that, yes, in my, I am weak, but he is strong. Yes, I'm infected, but he is pure. Yes, he is changing me. And the more I see of his holiness and the more beauty I see of his character, the more I realize how far I've been from that. that that's different than if you look at your life before you came to Christ and how you used to function, how you're functioning now. They're not the same. Yes. So, so we say, thank you, Jesus. I can see you are still working in my heart and mind. Keep up the healing work. Search me and find every defect in me. Create in me a, a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is what we pray when we find those shortcomings. Yes. Yeah. Can you put that last slide back up again? Yeah, that's up to Dean. <laughs> So now we're going to go on to the next paragraph, so he's going to move slides. Paul then continues in Ephesians 3.10. He writes, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, who are the rulers and authorities, who are the rulers and authorities of heavenly places mentioned here? How does the church announce God's manifold and multifaceted wisdom to them? Though Ephesians 3.10 does not describe the nature of the powers, it seems best to take them as the evil ones described in more detail in Ephesians 6.11 and 12. If so, the composition of the church unifying Jews and Gentiles as, one, as, as once very divided parts of humankind becomes a ringing announcement to these demonic rulers and authorities in the heavenly places of God's plan for the future to unite all things in him, Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. They are put on notice that God's plan is underway and their doom assured. The very nature of a unified church signals their ultimate defeat. And my first thought immediately was, if the very nature of a unified church signals their ultimate defeat, does the fact that in Christianity today that we have over 41,000 different groups arguing back and forth who's right signal their ultimate success? or it's a signal that they're currently succeeding. I think it does. If, if, if a united church signals their defeat, then what does a church divided into 41,000 different groups signal? Does it signal the defeat of demons or are they winning? Currently. Currently. But you could look at it differently too. One world order. <laughs> kind of comes under the unification of all the churches and everything into one thing, but that thing could be wrong. Do you see anywhere in the world today the unity amongst the church that Paul is describing here? Do you see it anywhere? I have never seen this type of unity in organized denominational systems. Never. I have seen this unity among people who are reborn to have Christ living in their hearts. I've seen it. Irrespective of denomination. There's a unity. There is an absolute unity of faith, of love, of respect, of, 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 of methods and principles, of honesty and integrity, of love for God and love for others. There's a unity, a fellowship, a harmony, and we grow closer to each other, 
even if we were baptized in a different way, even if we worship on different days. There is a unity. The problem is we want to define the unity as uniformity through a unified, codified system of behavior and doctrinal attestations. That's what we want to do. And we'll talk more about that next week. That's what next week's lesson is all about. Consider this parable about the unity in the church that Paul is talking about. Consider this parable. Not for me. This is from somebody you may admire and respect. His name is Jesus. <laughs> you find this in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Jesus told another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed into your field? And where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull, up, uh, pull, pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. What is Jesus telling us with this parable? Who are the wheat and who are the weeds? What's the field? The world. The field is the world? the church. Or is it the church? The difference between the two is one is fruitful and one is not. Well, that's true. In Christ's object lesson, page 71, I found this following commentary. Christ's servants are grieved as they see true and false believers mingled in the church. They long to do something to cleanse the church. Like the servants of the householder, they are ready to uproot the tares or the weeds. But Christ says to them, nay, Lest while you gather the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. So this commentary sees the field as the church. Wow. In the church are the true wheat, God's people, growing up in maturity, bearing fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. And in the church, Satan has planted his agents. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's planted them there. They're active and working in the church. Jesus describes them later when he said, they will come to me at the last day and they'll say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We perform miracles in your name. We cast out demons in your name. In the name of Jesus, they're doing this. They're not doing this name of Buddha. Mm -hmm. Yet ye hence, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. If true and false believers, wheat and weeds, are mixed together in the church, then how is the manifold wisdom of God being real to, revealed to the principalities and powers of darkness through the church? that Paul was talking about, that the quarterly was saying, our unified church testifies to them, but Jesus said the church isn't unified, we have wheat and weeds growing up together. Because the manifold wisdom of God is found in his true church, which is the fellowship of converted souls, not a denomination. In a field in a field mixed with actual wheat and weeds growing up together, all the wheat, all the wheat in that field have a common genetic ancestry and produce a common fruit. All the wheat are united in what they are, what they are and what they produce. They produce the same fruit. And it is apparent for all who have eyes to see that the fruit of the wheat is different than what the weeds produce even when they're in the same field. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Yes. Weeds only produce weeds. <laughs> Thus the manifold wisdom of God is manifest through his people, his true church, in contrast to the fakers, the religious zealots, the legalistic rule-making followers of a Roman dictator God who seem to run most of the church and who take up space in the church, but instead of producing peaceable fruits of righteousness, produce coercion, fear, guilt, shame, control, and division. Wow. 
Wednesday's lesson, let's talk about this. We'll close on this. Have you ever heard this about the family, about the metaphor, the family of God? Have you heard uh, the term family of God? I've uh, written a blog on it recently, talked about it in class a couple months back, and I've gotten some pushback from certain segments of good-hearted people about that. So I've, I've studied a little more on it. And, uh, and, and, the, and the pushback comes from people that ask basically this premise. In your family, are only the good children considered members of your family? <laughs> That's the premise. Yeah. So that righteous or unrighteous, in their view, are considered members of God's family. This is their view. This idea is, is neither right nor wrong. It's simply incomplete. It's an incomplete idea that leads to a misconclusion. The truth is that there are actually today, because of Adam's sin, there are two family, human family trees. Two human family trees. The first family tree descends from Adam, who was created by God, and thus every human being born in this world is part of the human family descended from Adam. And in that regard, being born of Adam is a child of God by creation. However, Adam corrupted himself with sin, and Adam severed the human connection with heaven and aligned himself with Satan. Without divine intervention, all humans born on that tree will die eternally, separated and disconnected from the heavenly family. That's the state that we inherit from Adam. We are therefore, if you want to think of it as a plant, we are a tree cut off at the roots, wilting and dying. There's a second family tree with a new head, and that is Jesus. We become members of his family, when we accept him as our savior and are grafted into the vine and we are the branches. He is the vine, we are the branches. And when we do that by faith, we receive the, the current of life, the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ being reproduced in us. No longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. We get new heart, we get reborn, we get new spirit, we get new motives. Uh, the old dies and the new comes to life. This is become part of the family of heaven with the motives and the principles of heaven produced in us through our connection with Christ. Amen. Amen. So just as there are two family trees, one of sin and death and one of righteousness and life, there are two births, one of the natural human fleshly birth and born into this terminal sin condition and a rebirth in which we're reborn into Christ Absolutely. and his righteousness. Yeah. Those who are born into the world are not, uh, but are not born into, reborn into Christ do not become part of the heavenly family. They instead are considered part of the human family, severed from God, and connected in heart, mind, spirit, attitude, character, and function, function if they stay unconverted to Satan's family. The members of the heavenly family look like Jesus, and they carry, out, they carry the image of God around in how they live. The members of Satan's family look like Satan and carry his image around in how they live. And Jesus actually said that of those Jewish leaders who were claiming both Abraham and God as their father. Jesus said to them, you belong to your father, the devil. And then the apostle John said, to all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God children born not of natural descent not, nor of human decision or a husband's will but born of God. Amen. This is how we become part of the family of God. Amen. The heavenly family. Now here's a couple of quotes we'll close with from one of the founders of the Adventist church. First is thought from the Mount of Blessing 110. If, you, if this is a condition, if you have renounced self and given yourself to Christ, you are a member of the family of God. And then Selected Messages, Volume 2, 265. Remember that the Lord loves you and that each one of you can become a member of the family of God if you are faithful here and so forth and so on. And it's a choice. We surrender and accept rebirth. We become part of the heavenly family. That's really what is being said here. Let's close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that when Adam chose to sever his connection with heaven, that Jesus took up the case and became a real human being and reconnects us back to heaven again 
And we ask now that the Holy Spirit will take the victory of Christ, reproduce it in us, that we can walk on this earth living representatives of your heavenly family. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So short. 